And welcome. I'm Bill Newell from MSONewsports.com. Rick Moore is here from the website as well. Salem News Sports Writers, Phil Stacy, Matt Williams, and Nick Giannino. Phil, a little late there, but we got you, we got you there. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> so everybody, welcome. Good to be talking with everybody. We're now into the month of July. We're into summer. We have the Red Sox practicing underway. We have the Navigator season underway. So baseball is back here on uh, here in the uh, here in the country, if you will, practice-wise for the major leagues, but also for the Navigators. Matt, I know you and I were both over uh, Tuesday at uh, Fraser Field as the team was uh, had been working out, I guess, for their 12th day. So maybe 13 days of workouts before their first game, which was Thursday night uh, in Nashua. But uh, you know, uh, it's one of those things. I don't know how many fans will be able to fit into the stadium, but it uh, looks like these teams are kind of loaded in the Futures League with the other leagues having canceled, minor league baseball canceled, and uh, these other college leagues also uh, not happening this summer. Pretty cool, right? I mean, we saw uh, Nashua, the first uh, stadium they played in, was sold out uh, for the Thursday opener. Now, you know, that's obviously – I'm not sure what the capacity is in New Hampshire. I know at Fraser Field to start, it's going to be 25%, uh, you know, which is, you know, uh, team president Derek January was hoping 11, 1200 or so. So uh, even if it's, uh, you know, close to that number in Nashua, that's pretty good. I mean, that means people aren't afraid to go to the ballpark. They're interested. It's pretty cool. Um, you know, all the social distancing measures will be in place. I think um, the timing is right. You know, one of the things I said to DJ was, uh, you know, everybody's used to distancing now from being in Dunkin' Donuts and the supermarket. You know, we know how to do, uh, you know, not crowd the person in front of you in line, right? How to go one-way streets when you're walking around. So, I mean, we've been doing this for a couple months. We're used to it as a people. So I think that you know, we're going to know how to stay away from other people at the ballpark so we can all get outside and, and be okay. And, uh, you know, Bill, I don't know about you uh, watching them practice a little bit. We were both there with, with some of our colleagues from some of the other papers and stuff. Uh, I was impressed. It, it seemed like some of those guys were moving around pretty good, pretty fluid. Um, you know, it, it looked like regular baseball workouts. Nobody looked to be uh, out of shape or anything. Uh, you know, it, it was pretty uh, impressive to uh, see those guys doing their thing out there at, on the infield when we were there earlier this week. Yeah. Well, at my age, they all look like they're moving around pretty good out there, Matt. <laughs> I'll tell you what, one unsung hero that, that I uh, was very impressed by was Logan Bravo uh, from Harvard and, and late of Austin Prep. Geez, uh, this guy... I mean, he had a decent season for them last year, but he, he looks like he's grown. He's, he's filled out his frame. I mean, he, he, he looks like a gazelle out there on the baseball field. I, I, he was the guy that, to, to, to me, really stood out and is going to be my uh, podcast uh, sleeper prediction for uh, <laughs> one of the NAV's uh, best players this summer is Bravo. I, I thought he just looked ready to, uh, ready to shine. Yeah. So if that proves prophetic at the end of the season, we can say, Willie, Bravo. Ah, ah, pretty yeah. good, pretty, pretty good. Yeah, that one landed like my father would say, like a fart in church, but I thought it was funny. <laughs> I liked it. I mean, you know, but I'm easy. Well, that, that I mean, they also have uh, Sal Freelich back from uh, Lexington and Boston College. He was with them two years ago. Usually in that league, you don't come back like that uh, in your third year, um, uh, but the Cape League was canceled. That's the case with some other players as well. And he is just a really nice looking ball player with a great swing as we've talked, I think we talked about him maybe last week or two weeks ago on the podcast, but, uh, but I mean, that would not be a sleeper pick if you will, for sure. Somebody that's done so well in the league before, but uh, it's interesting. I talked to Dylan January, Derek's son uh, this week and uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see how these young high school, it'll, it's the first time these high school kids have really played with college kids. So it's a, it's really kind of a step up. So you get a lot of these, high school seniors on the team. And you also have a kid like uh, Todd Tringali from Saugus back. He uh, graduated a year ago from high school, but uh, he's, he's back on the team and so on. So a lot of, a lot of interesting local names on the squad, a bunch of Swamp Scott kids, Bo Dana from Marblehead and so on. So there's, there's a pretty good roster, young man from Linfield as well, um, who we talked about with uh, Andy Carboni on our uh, baseball um insider podcast i'm just blanking it's uh looters John looters. looters from John, linfield yeah, yeah. Field there. real smooth defensively yeah yeah so right on 
It's exciting. I mean, I think one of the most exciting things is like, you know, they had their roster all set in November with guys coming in from, you know, Texas and Louisiana and all these, you know, uh, uh, exotic locales. And, and, you know, of course, with the pandemic, they're all staying home. So for them to be able to stop on a dime and, and go find, you know, Division One great ball players with local connections that are right here in Massachusetts to, to fill those gaps as their league's canceled. I mean, that, uh, that just goes to show you how deep the uh, ties in the community go for, for the Januaries and for Joe Gill and the rest of the NAVS people to be able to shift focus like that and, and get those local guys. It, it's a testament to those guys and a testament to the amount of talent that's around this area right here that, that you know, doesn't need to go elsewhere to play. It's, uh, it's pretty cool. So, um, you know, kudos to them for holding out hope this long and uh, hopefully it uh, pays off for everyone. You know, for the last six months, it seems like every week they're adding two more players. I'm surprised their roster is not like 75 strong. You know what I mean? It's, why don't they have 75 players on that roster? Yeah. They, they might by the time it's over. Yeah. I wonder if they have any idea of what uh, the crowd is going to look like there. You know, I mean, is it, do we know, is it 25% capacity at this point? That's right. Yeah. So I wonder what the, uh, the demand has been for tickets or if they have an idea. I mean, I would think that could sell out very quickly. Um, 25% of Frazier is what, 500 people maybe, I'm guessing? Yeah, how many does it hold? I was going to well, say 3,000, but it's not that much. Is it 3,800, uh, Willie, yeah. or something like that? Yeah, he, you know? I mean, so, so unofficially they told us that they were, you know, hoping – like 11, 1200, if they can get that many, but you know, I, I don't know if that includes the workers. I mean, so they're going to do most of their ticketing online. I think all the ticketing has to be done online, no cash, you know, just to cut down on the, uh, you know, things changing hands and, and distancing as we know. Uh, so, you know, check out NS NAVs. Uh, and I'm sure that just like Nashua did uh, on Thursday, you know, if there's any, uh, you know, there'll be, in other words, uh, issuing updates on Twitter and, and on social media throughout the day there on the opener Tuesday just to, you know, let folks know, uh, you know, when they do run out uh, of, uh, of tickets, I'm sure. Because, I, I, yeah, I mean, it feels right. I imagine that, uh, you know, at least for the first one, uh, they, they probably fill up, uh, you know, before first pitch. Right. wonder if they're going to jack the ticket prices up, up to try and break even there. I don't think so, but, you know, I, I actually haven't looked at that. Well, you know, uh, Derek January took, took over the team, uh, you, know, you know, bought it, you know, less than a year ago at the end of last year or whatever it was. And I talked to him over the winter or fall or whenever it was. Uh, and, of course, you have this plan in place for, for, um, for, for stepping it up, if you will, and then the virus hits and, um, and the season is delayed. And so I kind of asked him the other day, like a week or two ago, what's the business plan? And basically he goes, what business plan? You know what I mean? So, you know, they're just going to, what are they going to have really like a month of season, maybe six weeks of a season and playoffs and so on. It's going to, it's not going to be that long uh, as it all turns out because uh, it never was that long to begin with. And they've already lost what five weeks, I guess, of the season, it seems like. So, yeah. uh, yep. so in other words, it, it is what it is and they'll, they'll get something in this year and that'll, that'll be it. And then, Hopefully next year, 2021, as we all say, hopefully that'll be a better year, you know? Look on wood. Can't be work Well, I shouldn't say that. So can I change? No, don't say it. God. Can I change the subject here for a second? Of course. Sure. I'm going to listen to you guys uh, you know, with Bill. And uh, um, I, I want to ask you, you guys as reporters, um, how do you go about uh, uh, changing, changing the mindset in doing your sports stories because you've had to be so creative and the stuff you've done is, is really cool. You're digging out the, uh, you know, the encyclopedia, you're digging out the, uh, the sports files and so on, but to come up with the ideas and then to sit down and do what you do and research that and go get guys. And, and maybe I'll start with you, Phil. Uh, you guys get together sort of weekly and say, okay, no sports again this week. What can we do? Um, yes and no, if that makes sense. Um, we do talk. I mean, of course, none of us are working out of the office. We're all at home. Um, I have been doing a lot of um, on the news side of the newspaper during the pandemic. I still am uh, overseeing sports and I talk to these guys uh, almost every day, I guess. But um, 
there was someone on, on our staff that was on maternity leave, another editor, and I filled in for her for quite a while on the news side. And now it's kind of, uh, you know, I do a little bit of both sports and news. But to answer your question, we just try to brainstorm ideas that we think would be of interest to the readers. In that sense, it's really not that much different from what we do during the, when there's regular sports going on. Um, the biggest difference is we don't have games. But because especially, um, you know, Willie and I have such institutional knowledge and Nick is really good about diving in and educating himself on stuff that maybe he wasn't around for. Um, and the, the vast resources that we have in terms of contacts and um, history we can research and things like that. We're able to track things down and, and we try to make it as interesting as we can. I mean, um, Willie came up with a great idea early this spring. It might have even been uh, pre-pandemic, Willie, wasn't it, when we were talking about the rings? Oh, sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but we I came up with an idea last year about logos and, like, who has the best logo in our area and things like that. And I got a lot of buzz from people voting online and picking their favorite and all. And it didn't turn out at all how we thought it would, which was great. And Willie had kind of thought, something along similar lines with championship rings so we were able to get what did we get almost 30 rings Willie I think it was close to it yeah all together yeah. yeah different people sending us from different years you know whether it's St. John's Prep football or Marblehead hockey or uh, Beverly lacrosse or whatever you know we get all these different state championship rings and we put them in like a bracket type format and let uh, the readers vote on it online so that right there is an idea that, um, you know, has worked well. Now, you know, normally this time of year, Rick and, and Bill, you guys know, it, it's a slowdown. Uh, our bread and butter is obviously the high school stuff. With no high school stuff going on now, I mean, that's no different than in the other year. There's no high school stuff going on in July or August. So we, we're always trying to find stuff to do. But we've had to be a little more creative because we don't have um, say like the Little League tournaments to fall back on, the Aganis games to fall back on. So we just tried to tap into our resources as best we can. And um, it's certainly a good sign that things are coming back, like the Navigators or the Essex County Baseball League and some golf and things like that. But we, um, you know, between the three of us, we, we, we can probably generate a 15-watt light bulb and come up with A couple of good ideas, uh, whether it's, you know, just asking questions to high school seniors, um, profiling different kids each day that way, or um, doing some of the, you know, teams of the decade. We've done some of those, but didn't want to go to the well too, too often. We will have some more later this summer. But, um, you know, just, just different things like that. We, we've tried different things, some hits, some miss, but uh, certainly appreciate you saying you like what we've been putting together and as much as I think we enjoy it and have been doing a good job and it's been a chance to catch up on some things that we don't normally get a chance to do, I think all of us would safely say that we'd much rather there'll be actual games and, uh, you know, profiles to write and features and things like that. You know, Phil, you mentioned the championship rings. Uh, there, are, there are my championship rings right there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, Willie, tell us more about that, by the way. What, what's the deal on that? Because I saw you tweeted something on that this week. And so can people still submit photos of those rings? I know we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, but where do, we, where do you guys stand on that one? So we got, uh, we got 20 uh, high school rings. So we, we put them all in a bracket. And, uh, of course, as we know from following the MIAA, if, if you don't have a factor of eight or four or 16, uh, you have to do play-in rounds. So this week was the play-in round. So uh, tomorrow, well, as by the time you watch this, readers, viewers, uh, you know, we'll be down to the Sweet 16, and, and the voting will begin on Monday uh, to narrow that 16 down to eight. So what we did was, uh, you know, we got rings from, I think it was 13 or 14 different schools. So those schools that sent in more than one got in the play-in round. So by design, each school is going to have at least one ring in that round of 16. And then after this is over with the voting, we'll feature some of the college rings and some of the other rings that we got that maybe didn't fit into the bracket. The, the response was so overwhelming. We got yeah. too many. In the city uh, baseball league? 
Yep. Yeah, we got uh, NCAA lacrosse, NCAA hockey, uh, some prep school stuff. Salisbury School uh, sent one, uh, College World Series. I mean, so there's, there's going to be some cool stuff. And, you know, People hey, for me, are proud of their rings, and they should be. Uh, for me, it's just the design, the, you know, the uniqueness, each one. I mean, you know, you always hear about the professional rings. I always go back to the Patriots and the way they, uh, you know, incorporated those numbers 28 and three into that falcon ring so many times right there's 28 diamonds on one side and three on the other and all that kind of stuff so i look for like those little unique touches um you know what's personalized about it um you know without influencing the voting like the, the danvers boys basketball one that we got was the third one from their dynasty right so they put three trophies on there not just one uh which i thought was cool you know so i just think the the subtle differences in them are pretty cool. I mean, we got one from as far back as 1990 and, and as recently as just two years ago. So it, it sort of encapsulates, a, 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 you know, what's that, 30 or 40 years of, of North Shore sports history. So that's pretty cool. You see the progression, too. Like you mentioned the 1990, that's the PVD high ring. Yeah, and we have a Salem uh, 92 as well. Okay. 90 so the, as well, I should the, say. The PVD <laughs> ring is just like a blue uh, – I'm going to get my gemstones wrong here, but what is that? Opal or topaz or whatever that is? I presume it's like a fake, but yeah. But I think yeah, it's, okay. You know. But it's like a nice, uh, a, uh, like a Caribbean ocean blue surrounded by a ring. It, it's certainly nice, but when you look at the progression of what now it goes into some of these rings, it's yeah. crazy. So mm -hmm. I, I like that part of it too. I mean, look at that St. John's one just from this year. I mean, it's with the plaid and the glass. I mean, it's, it's you know, the yeah. most recent 2019 St. John's football one looks, uh, you know, that's a nice one. Oh, it's probably better than some actual Super Bowl rings from the first 25 years of Super Bowls, you know? Ooh, probably better than Mean Joe Green's. Yeah, or uh, uh, Refrigerator Perry's ring or something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Nick, Nick, what's it been like you as, as the relative newcomer to, uh, to, to try to get a year's, uh, 10 years worth of features in three months? Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a lot easier when you can go out and cover stuff fresh and uh, you've got names oh, for and, sure. uh, faces right there. What's it been like for you? Well, for one, I think it's easy with the golf because these two guys are in uh, really golf aficionados, so to speak. So anything golf related, I can take over that. And of course, they are playing competitive golf right now and, you know, the amateur level, recreational and PGA. So that helps. So I've done some golf stuff, but there's always stories out there, you know, no matter if sports are being played or not, there's always features or, you know, kid committing to a college or doing something different. I just wrote about a wiffle ball league. They started in Hamilton Wenham. So a lot of these stories that we're coming up with, are still good stories, but they might not make the paper when we're really busy with sports going on. Mm -hmm. But now without sports going on, we say, oh, you know, this is a pretty good story. We'd love to get this in there. And it works out great. So, you know, I don't want to say it's been easy, but it hasn't been super difficult to kind of ride the wave right now and get some stories in there. And uh, yeah, I think, you know, for the most part, we've done a good job splitting it up, splitting up the features and trying to find different different stuff, different angles. But, um, yeah, that's that's kind of how I feel about it right now. Yeah, I mean, he's being modest. It's it's really, uh, you know, Nick and Willie doing the, the heavy lifting here where I've been kind of focused on the news side of things. Um, I can guide them a little bit, and, and I do contribute here and there, and I hope to be doing it a lot more this month. Um, but these guys have really done yeoman's work while I've been um, – I've been – uh, you know, kind of re, uh, not reassigned, that's not right, but kind of made a lateral move. I mean, I, I joke with my boss um, that I feel like uh, I'm the position player who they asked to come in and pitch in the eighth inning of a 14 to two blowout. You know, that's how I'm helping out news, just doing what I can. Not my field of expertise at all, but, uh, you know, helping out and, um, you know, if it's ever going to happen when there's a global pandemic and no sports going on, I guess that's the time to do it. So uh, these two guys have really been terrific as far as doing a lot of the heavy lifting and getting stuff out in sports. And it just shows how talented both of these guys are and the strengths that they have and the skill set that they possess. And, and I hope that the people who um, 
you know, read our sports section and follow our interactions on social media and things like that, realize how talented these two guys are. I've got the chance to get my face in front of the camera a little bit more too with my uh, whole story golf video. I don't know if Bill or Rick, you guys have seen that, but I've highlighted a different golf hole from a different course here on the North Shore once a week. Just kind of talked about the whole, what makes it, you know, interesting, what makes it tough, challenging. Have and, you used uh, the word undulating yet? No, I haven't. I'm going to have to sneak that in there. I don't know how. That's a Gary special. I don't know how any of those greens that you've been to haven't been undulating. <laughs> <laughs> Not really a word that comes to mind right away, but I'm sure some of them have been. Especially with got elevation changes. That's the, that's the one I use. But Gasper used, yeah, the, word, that's good. Gasper used the word two weeks ago in the Globe in a sports that I'd never, I've never seen it before. In 40 years of teaching, I've never, I had to look it up, and he's got this word about 10 syllables long, and I don't even remember what it, what it meant now. So uh, I'm, you, you guys are catching up. You're doing all right. Undulated. The, uh, the uh, thesaurus is pretty good for that, too. <laughs> Come up with some new words. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, the hardest thing about the creativity with the pandemic is finding room for all the different ideas. We've been running out of room, and then – yeah. You know, there may not be games, but there's still news going on. Uh, you know, transactional news, the MIAA changing things. You know, you want to cover that day to day. Uh, you know, certain schools might be, you know, picking up a sport, starting a new sport, getting rid of a sport, things like that you want to be on top of. So, I mean, there's still, you know, kind of, I, I guess what you'd call in professional sports, the business side of sports. And, and in high school, it's not really a business, I guess. But, you know, there there is off the field news so you know you, you want to be engaged and, and not miss that stuff and then still also have room and and you know you think of like five cool projects and you know maybe they don't all fit in a week and and you want to like make a post-it note to yourself and stick it on the wall so you don't forget you know yeah you know, uh, Nick, I would have uh, died when I was in high school. Uh, for We would have died to have newspaper coverage of our wiffle ball league, but that never happened. Um, yeah, yeah. But, but Willie, maybe you could uh, chime in because, and, and uh, Phil as well, because you guys did a story on the Masco girls hockey team. What's the background between that? Because that's an interesting story, I think, right, as to what happens with that team? Sure. So, like, uh, girls hockey, most of the schools co-op, which is, you know, so you have more than one school that, um, more than one school that, that, you know, combines together. So, Masco used to go with North Andover, and, you know, nine or ten years ago, North Andover departed, and uh, Newburyport uh, joined up. And at this time, Newburyport would like to start their own team, uh, you know, if the other partners uh, go with Newburyport. That would leave Masco on its own. Uh, there's been some discrepancy about how many players they may or may not have. So, in other words, if they have enough players to have their own team, that's great. If they don't, they would have to join a different team or find another school to join their team. Uh, there's some discrepancy about the MIAA grandfather rule uh, because if you change a co-op and it's someone's senior year, that someone has – the right to say, I'm not going to join a new team. I want to play my senior year with the kids I've been playing with for the last four years. So if Masco does exist as a team, then some of those other kids that would go to Newburyport would have that option. If they took that option, Newburyport might not have enough kids. So there is um, a lot of moving parts. It's unfortunate. I mean, it, it's good in the sense that for the growth of the game, right? I mean, you want it to be like soccer where every school has – their own team and enough kids. Um, so in the sense that maybe if there's enough kids for two teams, um, that's a really good thing, right? It means the sport is growing. But anytime you change anything, it's going to be someone's senior year. It's going to upset the apple cart, and it's going to be a little bit awkward. So uh, it remains to be seen whether Masco will have enough kids to have their own team, whether they'll choose to join a different team. I mean, they're really exploring their options. They have to see how many of the eighth graders enroll – um, you know, because it's a global pandemic, right? Kids that maybe were thinking about going to prep school, maybe they won't go. Um, you know, maybe they won't even have winter sports. I mean, we don't know. And, and I think that, you know, the oversight group, right? I mean, th there's a lot of things that they're worried about right now as far as trying to get fall sports off the ground, trying to figure out what's going on with the pandemic. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that, like, it's on the front burner, um, you know, worrying about one particular girls hockey team. So. 
uh, a lot of pros and cons, a lot of moving parts, and uh, remains to be seen and what might happen. I mean, I think um, we see co-op partners change from time to time in girls hockey. I mean, that's not really all that uncommon. Um, Typically, a school that hosts like Masco doesn't change. Typically, the guests will move around. So like I said, North Andover, for instance, move from Masco to Haverhill. Um, you know, things like that will happen. Um, Gloucester, for instance, uh, their kids used to play for Marblehead. And they're, you know, exploring, starting a new team. They may or may not be varsity this winter. Uh, so, you know, that's a good thing for them. I mean, Gloucester used to have a team. That team folded. And now they're starting it back up again. So if Masco has to go somewhere else for a couple of years, I'm guessing a couple of years after that, they'll have enough kids to have their own team again. So it, it's definitely not, you know, even if they don't have a team of their very own next year, I don't think it's forever um, based on the number of hockey players there are in that town based on the Masco youth numbers. Um, so you know, the bottom line is that every kid in the school that wants to play hockey is going to have a chance to play hockey. You know, whether it's in a Masco jersey or in a different jersey, we'll see. But it's not as if anyone's going to lose their chance to play. So, I mean, that's a plus. I know, just uh, for everyone, we got to... rambling. Any questions? I mean, can I clarify? I don't know. I, I... Let, Yeah, I got... Um, so, we got a two-minute warning here. Two minutes left in our podcast here. But, Willie, one last thing. It's not related to Masco going into the Northeastern Conference. It wasn't triggered by that at all. No, right? no, no. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. That's really coincidental. Um, yeah. I would imagine that the new, if the Newburyport team comes and Masco goes, that Newburyport would fill in that spot in the, in the league, and the league would have the same number of teams. Uh, that's just my guess. Yeah, uh, Matt mentioned uh, one-way traffic. I get, before you guys go, I have to ask you, have you guys covered what happens in a grocery store if you go the wrong way on a one-way aisle? Because it's nasty. I've done that. And I've done it, too. You the, don't want to uh, do it. You just yeah, don't want the, um, the employee there was not too happy with me. I didn't even notice the lines. It wasn't intentional, but, you know. Oh, but, oh, 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 but the lady with the cart. Uh, full, uh, uh, no, you just don't want to do that. And, man, yeah. am I so and, – and, like, so now if I forgot something in an aisle, you got to go all the way around to come back. It's it's a learning experience, but I'm getting there. It really is. <laughs> you, you know what I did the other day is that there was nobody in the aisle, and I needed the one thing, and it was, like, 10 feet down. So what I did is I backed down the aisle walking without my cart in yep, case yep. if anybody looked, they'd say, oh, this guy's going forward. And then they would just have to, you know, they wouldn't focus on me because they know I was facing the right way. I like that. But I was able to back okay. down the aisle, grab the can of coffee or whatever, and then put it in my cart back in the, on the other aisle. So Wicked smart. You know, Wicked. Yeah, it's, you know, you got you to gotta play the game. But at least I didn't endanger anyone either. <laughs> so, All right, man, I think we're out of time. Happy 4th of July to you all without fireworks this year, right? Happy 4th. Happy 4th, guys.